Hey guys, I'm Jeremy and today I'll tell you about my experience biking through Armenia and then living and working there for a few months. Uh, it's a really cool place. It's in the Caucasus area, sort of in the Middle East. It's between Iran and Turkey, so mostly surrounded by Muslim countries except for uh, Georgia. And so they've had a lot of crazy history in this time from all the invasions from the Muslims or different groups. And it was also part of the uh, Soviet Union. So anyway, super interesting place, but very different for sure. And so here's my story. And so for about the two years before this, I had been on a bike trip across Asia. And I lived in China for over a year. I lived in Nepal for a few months and I got through Kazakhstan and then I flew to Armenia because it's hard to go through Russia down to like Armenia or Turkey and as an American it's not easy to bike through Iran so at some point I had to fly basically. And so Armenia has a pretty interesting history as I mentioned you know it was a much bigger country than it is today like I think their height was around maybe like 100 BC most of Turkey. I would say definitely the eastern part, but a good portion was part of uh, Armenia, basically, and some of Azerbaijan and some other areas. And in history, the territory kind of changed. It was like Western Armenia and uh, Turkey, and then Eastern Armenia was part of Persia or Iran at some time. So really crazy history back and forth. You know, the Mongols came and you know destroyed things, and so really intense history and then of course from the 1920s after World War One until the early 90s it was part of the Soviet Union and then of course the worst thing of all was the Armenian Genocide which Turkey doesn't recognize it but around World War One and two or three years after that about one or 1.5 million Armenians were killed so I think all this history obviously has affected the people uh, in a certain way. It's kind of ironic because a lot of the architecture and stuff there is really gothic. And the people there actually until like through the 1990s, I guess all wore black. Like that's traditionally their clothes anyway. The color is black. And like today they wear all kinds of different things. But I guess even through the 90s, they wore black and... The people there even told me that, yeah, they're kind of a depressed people because of like all of this kind of history and stuff over the years. So regardless, you know, I had been in Asia for over two years, you know, most of that time in China and Nepal and stuff. So getting to Yerevan, the capital, it was really cool because it definitely looks and has a much more of a feel of like being in Europe. You know, you go out to bars, the people obviously look a lot different. You know, you go down to like the center square, like the opera house and some of those areas and having drinks outside and looking at the people go by and the women are gorgeous, actually. I was, I was surprised by that. Like, you know, people like Kim Kardashian, her dad's Armenian, so definitely pretty people. Not that she is my taste. Personally, I don't really think she's that pretty, but uh, definitely beautiful women, nice people, and the food was really good, so definitely had a good first impression, which to be fair, all of the places I've been, or I think most people go, are really interesting at the beginning. I consider this like the honeymoon period, you know, when everyone's new to China. Uh, I had met over years because I met, I lived there over 10 years. Or other areas, you know, they get somewhere, they're like, oh, this is awesome, I could live here forever. And then, you know, if you talk to them six months later or one or two years, that might change. But so I was kind of, you know, going through the honeymoon period right at first. It seems cool and everything's different and stuff like that. And so I met some, you know, nice people in those first few days, and I figured, you know, I'd just seen the city. I hadn't seen the countryside or biked it all yet, so I figured I would go down the southeast way towards Iran, basically, and kind of get a feel for the countryside and see some of these old churches and um, historical sites, because it's the first Christian country, I think around 301 AD is when it was declared uh, the first Christian country in the world, basically. So they have some like really ancient churches and stuff like that and really cool sites. So um, there's quite a few around the capital, but uh, yeah, I wanted to see some of the ones on the way, you know, basically to the border of Iran. And the trip was uh, pretty decent overall, you know, obviously trying different food and seeing different architecture and stuff like that. A few a little annoying or just different things like, you know, people's expressions are different maybe in Asia or some places, you know, people would like smile more, things like that. People looked a little serious. Of course, once you talk to them more, they would be friendly. 
Uh, the second day, it was really funny. I had uh, went to see one of these old churches, and then uh, afterwards, there was a bunch of people having a barbecue, and they invited me to come, and you know, they're drinking like vodka and stuff. So it didn't take long to get pretty ripped. And uh, I hung out with them for, I don't know, two or three hours or whatever, you know, eating and hanging out. And I'm so new to the country, so this is obviously always the funnest thing to do is like, you know, barbecue and drinking with locals, even if we couldn't converse well. And I guess the plan is what we understood, of course we couldn't communicate easily, is that I was going to go to the next village and I think I was going to stay at their place basically. And I still had, because um, I was going to throw my bike in the car and all my stuff, so I biked, it must have been like 15 Ks, I think it was almost an hour away still. And uh, yeah, I got to that town, I never saw them, I thought they passed me in the car or something. And so I kind of asked the lady about camping or something. She eventually pointed to a government building or something. I walked up, and the guy's like, oh, you could crash out here. I, I think it was actually like a lawyer's office or something like that. And so, yeah, I just randomly crashed out in some, like, guy's office, basically on his couch. And, you know, the next morning I just got up and uh, took off and... So yeah, the next few days I went to the border, and yeah, it was a couple unusual experiences. Like I said, there wasn't too much expression maybe on people's face. Like I'd seen some guys on the side of the road, uh, like making a fire and looking at me kind of serious, and I thought they were actually sizing me up. I was out in the middle of nowhere. I wasn't sure if I was going to get robbed, to be honest. Maybe I was completely wrong, but I think a cop car, someone drove by and I just kind of took off, but it did seem a little bit weird. And then I had a couple other kind of small annoying things like... A lady, I was using the internet, and they charged by the megabytes, and uh, basically the computer didn't work. I wasn't able to even open up anything, and she was still trying to charge me for like the 25 minutes I was there. I mean, it was honestly only a dollar, but sometimes these kinds of things are on principle. You know, you don't want to pay for something that you didn't get, right? And she was all like flabbergasted. Like, I walked out, I was like, I'm not paying. And there was another uh, village idiot, as I call them. There's always some idiot somewhere uh, in the countryside, in, these, in every country I've been to. And at this place, it was another one of these really interesting churches. And there was a night, he was working in a nice gift shop. I'm not sure if he was the owner. Obviously, if he was, he would have made some, some money there. So he wasn't broke or anything. And this is before the iPhone. So a lot of the time when I get to most countries, people want to like look at my photos or play with my iPod. Which is, I don't know if you know, an iPod is, is just for music, basically, or recordings. You know, it's got, you know, a couple hundred songs on there, right? I'm biking all day. I need my iPod. And he was kind of, like, listening to it for a minute. I'm like, oh, cool, whatever. You play with it for, for a minute. I think I might have even gone to the church and came back or, or looked around and had lunch or something. And then he's asking, like, can I have it? I'm like, no. And he really gave me a hard time about getting it back. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to even need my like $150 iPod that I listen to all day, you know. And then uh, when I finally got to the end of that five days, you know, I went to the bus station, which they're not even buses. They're more like uh, sh big shuttles, like vans. And uh, I went to get a ticket back. And of course, I had my bike. And in, you know, Asia, China and everywhere, of course, they have more room if it's a bus. But, you know, they might charge you a little extra or throw it at the bottom. No big deal. And they wanted me to buy the whole row of seats for my bike, which I thought was not that necessary. A lot of times, too, they'll put them, like, on the roof. And I also assumed the reason why maybe they didn't want me to put it in the back of the van is because usually in most countries I've been to, like China and all these other places, India or whatever, when people get on buses, I mean, they bring half of their household goods with them. You know, they've got all these bags of, uh, you know, potatoes and fruit and all these things and all their clothes. So there's no extra room. So I was like, well, there's no extra room. So that's why you're going to make me buy the seats. And then we get into the uh, van and like all of the passengers, like the locals, they had nothing. They just had like handbags and stuff. So he made me pay for the seats. So that was a little bit obnoxious. And it wasn't just even that. I don't even know if you get all the money from it because... You know, I went like I paid the actual bus station, but anyway, yeah, a little annoying. And then on the that bus or shuttle was uh, two Americans who worked in the Peace Corps. I think they were pretty new there, and they were going back to Yerevan for like the weekend or whatever. And so they they were telling me about you know the circumstances and whatnot. And they met up with another fifteen or twenty Peace Corps volunteers in Yerevan. And so I met up with them that evening and heard some of their stories. And a couple of the guys who had been there already a year definitely didn't like it. They had somewhat horror stories of, you know, being in the countryside and stuff. Which, I mean, fair enough. Like, I wouldn't even want to live 
in the countryside with some random family in America. If I spoke English, I mean, it's just, so Peace Corps people definitely have it pretty tough anyway. And also they're in the countryside. So I thought, well, you know, I mean, the city's different than the countrysides, but I was aware of some of these negative impressions I had the first few days or, or stories to, uh, of people talking about things. And so I befriended a few foreigners I was staying with, a few Iranian guys. A lot of Iranians go there to study because, of course, it's a more open society in Armenia. It's close by and not expensive. You know, they could drink and have a good time. You know, those guys were a lot of fun. We, we had a lot of good times. And so I met them and hung out with them. And another, I befriended another Armenian guy who actually was from Syria. He's a Armenian uh, who, whose family had lived in Syria, and at that time he was in Yerevan. And he also didn't like Armenia a lot. So it was kind of tough because he wasn't even interested in it. And so it was at this point I was, I was a little apprehensive about the idea of, of staying or anything like that. But I knew I, at this point, or within the next you know two or three months, it was like I needed to make some more money. I considered initially Israel... Because, of course, it's a, you know, a western types country where you can go out and have drinks and enjoy. But, you know, most Israelis know English, and I knew I wouldn't make too much money there. I knew in Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, you could make some money teaching. But I didn't really want to be in a Muslim country much. I do like, I, I like to drink, and I like to go out to bars and be in a city. I don't like to live in a compound where I'm not supposed to have alcohol, but I could kind of sneak around or... Or, or do it in a separate area. Like I want to kind of inter intermingle with the locals and drinking culture and that kind of thing. So, you know, Armenia seemed like kind of, that would be the most interesting place I could be. Obviously I couldn't do that easily in Iran. Of course, Turkey could have been an option too. Uh, they don't make too much there as well. And uh, I also considered Taiwan, but I had just been living in China, so I didn't want to go back to Taiwan at that point yet. So I figured I'd give it a shot. And so, you know, I went to like some of the NGOs, the U.S. Embassy and the U.N., this kind of stuff. Uh, as far as the U.S. Embassy or U.N., that's super hard to get into. I mean, you have to apply in your home country or there's like a really big process and definitely not easy to get like on the road. The NGOs don't pay much. So I knew it would be back to probably teaching English or something like that. So I inquired about that. It wasn't great paying, but there was a few places. And then through ISAC, which is an organization that helps students um, get jobs, like interns, basically. So you don't doesn't pay much. But I got a job working at a company, basically do, doing like their social media marketing. I think this company was basically a service that monitored websites for something. I don't know if it was traffic or whatever. And you could use it for free, but if you wanted more services, you'd have to pay. So from like, you know, 9.30 to 5.30, I sat in a room with a few people and, you know, no one talked at all, complete silent. And I'm basically trying to like post this company like in different blogs, like, hey, is anyone here, you know, looking to improve your thing? Check this out. And even if the people got it, only, you know, a much smaller percentage would actually even buy the service. So you're kind of, I mean, to me, it felt like just going to, you know, if I went to New York City and went to the highest building and just took a box of business cards and threw them off into the air and just hoped someone would call me or get my service, like definitely didn't feel fulfilling at all. And not my thing, just super quiet all day, no one talking. And that was the other ironic point too, is that no one talked to me at all. The woman who hired me was really nice, and, and one of the girls who was just out of college. But all of the other colleagues I had, you know, they could have like, you know, a party or go out or different things. Absolutely didn't talk to me at all. So I thought that was a little unusual. You know, usually people would be like, oh, where are you from? Where? You know, little small talk occasionally. Because some of them did know English. It wasn't like uh, there was no English or anything. So that was kind of weird too. Because, you know, when you take a job or work someplace, you want some social interaction. You know, not just uh, 40 hours a week of silence. So the job and stuff, I was like, I'm not going to do that long term. So I was like, that's okay. You know, I had some jobs teaching at night. And I figured I'd try to fill in the day with some English teaching jobs and that didn't really work out amazing either they really were quite focused on grammar and actually one of the first jobs I inquired for one of the bigger companies it was actually an American guy interviewed me and he asked like you know what was the difference of I lived or I have lived how would you explain the difference of this like the grammar and I said I didn't know, you know, I had taught in China, you know, for a year and a half and a little bit in Nepal, but it, it was always conversation pretty much. 
and uh, in all the other years in China, for the most part, like I net like people assume English teachers do a lot with grammar, and maybe in some cases they do, but generally overseas it's usually been the speaking and listening, and then local teachers do a lot of the you know grammar and stuff. And so these jobs were like, you know, a lot of the people were asking all these grammar things, everything, and I'm like, let's just go through the class and do the conversations. Like, you need to do the speaking and listening, in my opinion. And so then I taught some kids, but the kids had zero English, so that wasn't easy. And yeah, it wasn't looking like it was going to work out that well. Luckily, you know, I was initially there. I think you know you could get like a one or two month visa and extend it for a couple of months. But I didn't sign any contract for like a year or anything like that, which is uh, what I initially considered. So I knew I was probably going to take off within you know about a month. But in the meantime, you know, I had a, I had a good time. The few months I was there, there was a lot of cool bars you could go to. Like there was like the Beatles bar and a bunch of other places. You've got live music. And I hung out with like those Iranian guys and a bunch of other foreigners there working for the Peace Corps or NGOs. So I had a really good time there. It was just a lot of that time I was working quite a lot, and I knew um, I couldn't stay there long term, especially with the rent price. You know, the prices there were much higher than anywhere I lived in Asia. So you know, I'm not going to work like you know 50, 60 hours a week to you know barely make it by and not have any savings. You know, and at that same time, I got an apartment because I figured I'd be staying there, you know, for at least six months or something like that. And I got this old school, like Soviet style apartment, kind of up on a hill. It had a nice view of Mount Ararat. And, uh, but yeah, it was real old school. And, but yeah, even that wasn't super cheap. I mean, that was probably three or $400. So the cost of living was definitely kind of high. And it, I also wasn't looking forward to the winter too, because, you know, I, I'm from Buffalo, New York, and you know, you have the same kind of weather as like Buffalo, basically. Not as much snow, but definitely really cold. So after being in China and more tropical areas, I wasn't really looking forward to going through winter there. So I figured I'd head home for Christmas since I hadn't been home for three years. So I figured I would basically head back to the States. It was already three years had gone by, and I would do commercial fishing that summer. So I ended up actually working as a teller in a bank in Buffalo and doing jobs with my dad doing electrical. And then I did fishing in Alaska, salmon fishing and stuff. So you can see I made some videos on that you can check out. I've got three or four videos about that. And then I returned to Armenia that next fall, basically. And I did, you know, I biked to Georgia after that. And looking back, to be honest, I mean, Ar Ar Armenia is super cool, amazing food and everything like that, and uh, super interesting. But Georgia did seem a little bit cooler. I don't know how things are today. I know Georgia's quite popular lately. But I would check out both countries if you're considering uh, living or doing the digital nomad thing and uh, see what you like more. But definitely two amazing places you should check out. You know, like I said, the people in general were, were really cool, but you kind of do have this sort of depressive thing, you know, because of their history or whatever. I'm not sure. Uh, so there was that going on. A lot of the guys um, kind of dress like, they kind of look like they're in the mafia. So you have, they're called Robbies. And uh, so there's kind of like meathead kind of guys. So I couldn't really relate to those dudes too much. Uh, but I did make plenty of other local friends. So it's like anywhere else in the world. I mean, 97% of the people you don't really hang, you only have a small group of friends that you're really going to hang out with and have much in common with. And there were plenty of other foreigners there and stuff like that. So it was a cool time and I'm looking forward to uh, heading back because I haven't been there since 2008. So I guess it's been, yeah, almost 15 years. So definitely want to hit up there in Georgia. I haven't been to Azerbaijan yet and I'd like to see more of Turkey. So definitely a good place to bike. A lot of cool history and uh, good scenery and food, like I mentioned, and, and pretty cheap. And then, like I said, George is great as well. So definitely should check out Armenia. Um, I think it's definitely a place you can't miss. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you want to see more content. My channel has a lot of different stuff from uh, my travels around the world, whether hiking or biking, and some of the things over the years I've done, whether I was uh, in the military, uh, commercial fishing in Alaska, or uh, my experience living in China and Taiwan for 15 years, and I was a teacher there and led tours and did all kinds of stuff. So if that stuff's beneficial for you or entertaining, uh, subscribe, and I hope to see you next time. Cheers.